Why is nobody going to colonize Mars? Mars remains a scenario dominated solely by robots, with no human presence on its surface. As of 2025, only three rovers roam the Martian soil. The two American ones, Curiosity and Perseverance, and the Chinese Tianwen-1. These automated vehicles are the only inhabitants of Mars and, by all accounts, will remain so for a long time. Although there are plans and futuristic visions to establish a human colony on Mars, it is highly unlikely that this will become a reality in the near future. Many supporters of colonizing Mars point to two major motivations. First, there's what can be called the survival argument. For these enthusiasts, creating a base outside Earth would be the best strategy to protect against possible global disasters, such as nuclear wars or the impact of a large asteroid. If a catastrophic event were to occur, humanity would still survive if there were a settlement on Mars. The second argument focuses on economic and social prosperity. According to this view, industrial and commercial space exploration could bring huge financial and technological gains to our planet. This, in turn, could ease problems such as resource disputes and even armed conflicts, since, theoretically, there would be more materials and opportunities available for everyone. These ambitions to extend our presence beyond Earth did not start just now. In the second half of the last century, the so-called space race represented an intense competition between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, largely driven by the need to demonstrate technological and political power. It was in this context that historic achievements like the Apollo missions, which put humans on the moon, and the daring Soviet space programs, including the launch of the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, and the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, took place. Back then, almost all research and development of rockets and spacecraft were limited to government agencies, driven by massive budgets and the ideological rivalry between superpowers. Today, however, the scenario is quite different. Large private conglomerates like Orbital, Northrop Grumman, and Sierra Space, along with well-known companies such as SpaceX, are increasingly becoming the leading players in the aerospace industry, securing billion-dollar contracts and contributing significant innovations in propulsion, rocket reusability, and cost reduction. For the first time, not only governments but also corporations and individual investors are key forces in space exploration. A striking example is billionaire Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, who with Blue Origin shows clear ambitions, paving the way for millions of people to travel and even work outside our planet. The company openly talks about making space colonization feasible, opening up opportunities in research, tourism, and new economic markets. This growing participation of the private sector represents a profound shift in the dynamics of the space race turning what was once a political clash into a frontier of technological, scientific, and even commercial opportunities, capable of redefining our relationship with space. Another controversial billionaire, Elon Musk, plans not only to send humans to Mars, but also to establish a self-sustaining colony there. I have an enormous fascination with exploring the universe, Imagining humans stepping on Mars, building bases, and investigating its geological secrets has always inspired me. However, despite all this excitement, I feel the need to emphasize that we are not yet ready to achieve something so grand in the short or even medium term. If we insisted on establishing a Martian colony now, we would very likely face enormous risks that could potentially result in loss of life. There are four main reasons why nobody should be able to colonize Mars or any other distant place anytime soon. The first challenge is simply leaving our planet. Earth's gravity requires rockets to reach about 6.8 miles per second to escape its pull, which is a monumental task that requires an enormous amount of fuel. Since rockets need to carry all the propellant with them, it creates a cascade effect. The more mass you want to transport, the more fuel you need which increases the total weight of the vehicle and calls for even more fuel, and so on. In the end, something around dozens of tons of rocket are needed to put just a fraction of that weight into orbit. Some visionaries suggest building a permanent base on the moon to reduce launch costs, since it would be easier to escape gravity from there. The problem is that colonizing our satellite faces essentially the same technical hurdles as setting up a base on Mars. 
The second major difficulty is that space is an extremely hostile environment. The average distance between Earth and Mars exceeds 125 million miles, and with today's propulsion technology, it would take about 260 days to get there, plus the fact that the best launch windows occur only every two years, depending on the orbital alignment of the planets. During such a long trip, astronauts are exposed to microgravity, which can cause muscle atrophy, loss of bone density, and even vision problems. Preliminary studies also suggest that prolonged weightlessness might lead to neurological changes that could compromise fine motor skills. Moreover, the space radiation outside Earth's magnetic field is much more intense, increasing the chances of serious illnesses in the future. Furthermore, the Martian soil itself presents considerable dangers. The gravity is lower than Earth's, but we don't know exactly how that would affect the human body over months or years. Additionally, Mars does not have a magnetic shield like Earth's, exposing its inhabitants to higher levels of solar radiation. There is also perchlorate, a toxic salt that makes up about 1% of the Martian terrain. This element poses a health risk and could hinder the cultivation of plants for food and oxygen production. Consequently, any base would need to have strict decontamination and protection protocols. Even though humanity is in an exciting phase of space exploration, with major investors and innovative minds joining the game, we still don't have the technology or infrastructure needed to colonize Mars without taking colossal risks. For now, robots are our only representatives there and that is not likely to change anytime soon. Even though we are passionate about expanding our frontiers beyond the blue planet, we still need to tackle scientific, engineering, and human health challenges before we can truly call Mars home. Another challenge is ensuring the survival of the astronauts. Keeping people alive on Mars for long periods is a huge task because it involves providing enough food and oxygen. Although the red planet contains water underground, as well as oxygen in the elements that make up that water, any infrastructure to use it would need to be carefully designed. A potential Martian base would have to rely on industrial processes capable of extracting, purifying, and converting water into breathable oxygen, as well as making it safe to drink and use for food preparation. Another crucial point would be to maximize recycling opportunities, from organic waste to the air we exhale. When we breathe, we release carbon dioxide, a substance that can be used by plants or fungi to transform it into oxygen and raw materials for food. In this way, the colony would depend on an almost closed ecological cycle in which each organism's waste serves as input for another, all powered by solar energy or other high-capacity energy sources. Experiments to develop closed ecosystems on Earth are a crucial step toward understanding how we could sustain life in extraterrestrial environments, and the Biosphere 2 project is one of the most famous examples of such initiatives. Carried out in the early 1990s, it aimed to reproduce, on a small scale, a self-sustaining world. Eight volunteers were confined in a vast glass structure that only received sunlight from outside, with the goal of continuously recycling water, air, and nutrients. However, problems soon emerged that highlighted the limitations of the experiment. For example, oxygen started depleting faster than expected, requiring external interventions that ultimately compromised the initial goal of isolation. Besides the purely scientific difficulties, the social aspect was equally challenging. Intense interpersonal conflicts split the group into two blocks that barely communicated, creating an unsustainable climate of mutual hostility. In a scenario like Mars, where every resource, oxygen, water, food, would be even more precious and scarce, similar disagreements could have far more serious consequences, as total cooperation is essential for the survival of the team. With no immediate rescue available, any deep social rift could destabilize the entire mission. The Biosphere 2 experience serves as a warning. It's not enough to master the technical issues of sustaining life in extreme environments. It's equally vital to understand and manage the psychological and relational components, ensuring that participants maintain bonds of collaboration and empathy even under pressure. If such deep discord were to occur on Mars, where resources are limited and teamwork is critical, the entire mission could head toward a tragic outcome. Living on Mars requires going beyond just keeping people physically healthy. They must also maintain their mental sanity and be capable of making balanced decisions, always with the collective well-being in mind. 
So far, space exploration history does not record any major incidents caused by astronauts' psychological issues. At most, there has been what is known as a space strike, in which disagreements over workload arose aboard a station. Generally, professionals sent to space go through rigorous selection processes that assess their emotional stability and ability to work under pressure. However, if the goal is to establish a colony with a significant number of inhabitants on Mars, it won't be feasible to maintain such strict selection criteria. A diverse mix of people would be needed to create a minimally functional society, including specialists from various fields, as well as ordinary people performing everyday tasks. Anyone embarking on this adventure would have to deal with the fact that returning home might never happen, or, at the very least, would be extremely difficult. It's similar to explorers in polar regions, like Antarctica, where isolation and harsh climates can affect mental health. Maintaining harmony in such an extreme environment requires providing ways for relaxation and entertainment, as constant stress and the feeling of confinement can undermine social cohesion. This means having living spaces, leisure activities, and therapeutic support. All of this demands more energy and infrastructure, which only adds to the plan's complexity. Nuclear fusion would be an almost ideal solution due to its enormous potential for generating clean energy. But since we have not yet mastered that technology, the most viable alternative would be nuclear fission reactors. Although they are highly efficient, they carry risks of serious accidents, which is even more concerning on a planet where any rescue or evacuation would be extremely complicated. Moreover, sending radioactive material to Mars requires safe rocket launches because any in-flight failures could spread large-scale contamination. Even with a successful transport, many questions remain. How will plants react to the lower Martian gravity? How can we prepare the soil for cultivation without it being toxic? What local resources can be used to build shelters and facilities? How much will we need to import from Earth? Simulations on Earth are already trying to investigate the psychological effects of a long mission on the Red Planet. However, these experiments still foresee a return home, which wouldn't easily apply to a permanent colony. Until we develop reliable life support systems, dependable energy sources, and lasting supply mechanisms, any human settlement on Mars will rely too much on shipments from our planet and resupply is anything but immediate. Launch windows occur only every two years, and the trip itself can last nearly an entire year. Any serious problem occurring outside of that schedule would leave the colonists vulnerable for a long time, as help could take months to arrive, if it ever did. In the end, this scenario shows just how extremely costly and dangerous colonizing Mars would be in the near future. It requires mastering a series of technologies and processes to make this dream viable, and we are still far from achieving that on a large scale. Without massive investments and significant scientific advances, the prospect of creating a self-sustaining society on Mars remains closer to science fiction than to an immediate reality. Why should we colonize Mars? Many might look at everything discussed so far and think that colonizing Mars is something impossible, or, at the very least, unlikely in the near future. However, even with all the technical, health, and logistical obstacles, there are still powerful arguments in favor of this endeavor. First, there's the issue of access to new natural resources. In theory, if we could extract and process metals on Mars, we could dramatically expand our stock of raw materials, practically doubling the amount of certain minerals available to humanity. This would create space to relocate part of our industrial production away from Earth which could, in some way, reduce the impact of human activity on our ecosystem. Since there is no evidence of life forms on Mars, pollution produced by factories wouldn't harm any local organisms, at least based on what science knows today. However, there is a huge problem with the so-called wealth argument. For economic exploration of Mars to become a reality, we would need a much more efficient transportation system than anything currently available. Moving large quantities of material between the two planets would be necessary on a scale that current space missions can't even imagine. Think, for example, of iron. Humanity extracts billions of tons of this metal every year here on Earth. Even if the Martian subsoil were rich in iron, how could we transport all that material back to our planet in a practical and safe way? Today, that's simply unfeasible. It would be as complicated as trying to land a gigantic asteroid on Earth without causing catastrophic damage. Moreover, it's still cheaper to extract iron here on Earth than to build all the infrastructure needed to mine Mars, considering both the initial investment and the risks and logistical complexity. 
The survival argument also faces a big obstacle. For humanity to really be safe from any earthly apocalypse by settling on Mars, the colony would have to be completely independent. This means generating its own oxygen, growing food, producing energy, and maintaining a sufficient population for sustainable reproduction. In other words, we would need healthy babies growing up on Mars. However, every physiological and psychological challenge mentioned earlier only worsens when it comes to gestation, birth, and raising children in a place where we know almost nothing about the effects of radiation, reduced gravity, and the lack of adequate natural light. It's worth noting that such experiments to understand how babies would react to these conditions would be ethically unacceptable. Only in a very advanced scenario where the colony had all means of protection, medical infrastructure, and emergency support, would it make sense to consider forming Martian families? But reaching that level of development would take decades or even centuries, depending on scientific progress and the financial and political commitment involved. The best attitude in this scenario seems to be patience. If we look at the history of great explorations on Earth, like the conquest of the North and South Poles, we notice that these were only achieved when societies already had the technology to face such extreme environments. There was no vital need to reach the top of Everest or the glaciers of Antarctica. Even so, we went, driven by curiosity and the desire to overcome limits. Mars is even more radical extreme cold for much of the year, a thin and toxic atmosphere, high radiation exposure, and no natural ecosystem to provide support. On one hand, all this discourages those who dream of colonization. On the other, some see these challenges as a call to explore, something that is part of the human nature to venture into the unknown. So, how can we prepare to overcome the challenges of a manned mission or colonization of Mars? The answer lies in a virtue that seems scarce today. Calm. Rushing through research and development stages would only increase the risk of fatal accidents. We first need more reliable and affordable launch and propulsion systems, and perhaps even technologies that today still seem like science fiction, such as nuclear fusion. It is also crucial to understand much better how the human body adapts to environments with microgravity or partial gravity, like on Mars where gravity is about one-third that of Earth. Prolonged studies on space stations, test missions, and simulated laboratories on Earth are essential to understand the physiological and psychological changes that this kind of adventure imposes. Additionally, it would be advisable to carry out several research missions on Mars before considering any long-term base. Mapping local resources, testing building materials, conducting detailed soil analyses, and experimenting with prototypes of habitable structures should be top priorities. There's also the possibility of building a kind of rocket factory on the moon, which, being far from Earth's gravitational field, would simplify the logistics of exploring the rest of the solar system. But all of this requires massive financial resources, integrated scientific research, and international cooperation. Finally, if the goal is to ensure the survival of humanity, there's another even more fundamental factor. We need to protect and strengthen civilization here on Earth. It is naive to think that if we can't sustain our own planet, we will succeed in a colony on another, even more hostile world. Thus, the commitment to scientific progress, education, and political stability is essential, so that one day this cosmic dream becomes more concrete. We need to prove that we are capable of maintaining a lasting society on a vibrant planet like Earth, before taking a chance on a desert full of dangers like Mars. In the end, it is likely that sooner or later humanity will try to colonize the Red Planet. Human exploratory nature and the force of scientific progress lead us to believe that. However, it is not just a matter of will or resources. It involves a whole lot of technical, moral, and psychological preparation to face a ruthless environment. The question remains, if you had the chance to be one of the first to step on Mars and live there, would you take it? Leave your point of view in the comments. If you love the mysteries of the universe, feel free to subscribe to the channel, like this video, and turn on notifications. That way, you won't miss any news about our space journey and the advances that take us ever farther. Thanks for watching. See you on the next trip.